Welcome to another riveting episode of After Hours with Coot, with an E. <laughs> I am your host, Alex Rosa, and with me, as you would expect, is none other than the wonderful Ben Coot, with an E. How are we doing, man? Pretty good. Just holding up in here. Another day of quarantine. Another day. Have you actually, have you had to go to work, or? All have remote you, work, thankfully. All remotely. So, we're pretty safe, but, you know, it's still a little apartment that you're trapped in. Well, right, yeah. I mean, at least now you and uh, your girlfriend can have some, you know, some quality time together. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the joys of having a quality girlfriend is that I have right. quality time. Right, exactly right. <laughs> I do wonder, uh, you know, a lot of people are joking about like how in, you know, in nine months there's going to be a bunch of quarantine babies. But I do wonder how many relationships are falling apart at the seams because of having to be together 24-7 during this quarantine. <laughs> Some financial analyst will get bored one day and do the kind of the graphs and the percentages and all the rates that, you know, present themselves over time. Right, right. Oh, I did see that. Um, so for like a, one of the biggest concerns or for some folks has been uh, the weddings. I've seen a couple of people that they were like, we, we were planning this big ass wedding. Uh, but obviously with everything that's going on, we just said, fuck it and went to the courthouse and got married. Um, so do you think that this is kind of like the beginning of the end for the obligatory, like big fiesta for weddings? Uh, definitely not. But I think it's the beginning of the big over the top honeymoons. Uh, okay. The Burj Khalifa will see bookings in like the next six months go way up. Because well, again, act- you, you save 50k on a wedding. It's like, what do I spend this on? house kids no that's silly let's go on a trip right yeah so you think that there's gonna be like a kind of like a right now we're in the middle of like a bust period for travel but it's gonna boom once there, people are like well i did just save like 50k on this wedding why not just fucking take a year off and go travel the world <laughs> i think that's the best way to start a, a marriage is like if you've got the money like just fuck off for a year like right rather than spend it on one day like of course if there's like religious or family ties like Right. I mean, of course, you're ob- obligated, but like, if it's like you're just like you know, small family, have a little nice reception, and then spend the money on a big, you know, travel bonanza. Yeah, I mean that that seems like the the best course of action, especially once. What I imagine is that once everything kind of cools down and the quarantine stop and everything starts like reopening and everything, uh, I mean, airlines and you know all the travel agencies in general are gonna have to kind of like earn consumer confidence again and it's probably gonna be like a solid month where tickets anywhere are just gonna be cheap as shit so that uh airlines can like recoup their losses well i saw um easyjet did an email globally essentially saying any booking end of year going into february mid-february i think okay um 32 pound cap so any of their flights for a maximum of 32 gbp so that's pretty really pretty good like yeah if you want to take a gamble like it could blow over in two three months six months like it will blow over one day so are you you a black or a red man in terms of um (laughs) roulette (laughs) i myself am a hispanic man no need to bring race into this but i appreciate the sentiment (laughs) as a hispanic man what card like suits do you like feel yourself most related to are you a diamond are you a spade a club I mean, or a I'll, hearts man i would assume hearts right latinos are notorious for their passion and fervor so i would imagine that the hearts would probably be the best suit <laughs> it suits you well <laughs> um but no so okay so easy jet's already kind of hopping on that train i know that i saw something about um before everything went to full quarantine for like shutting down borders and stuff uh, they were already hacking prices to pieces uh, just to try to, again, recoup some of those losses. And now I believe the United States and Canada are going to come out in a joint statement to ban all on, uh, not unnecessary, but on, uh, what's I'm looking for? Uh, travel. Non-essential travel. Yeah, non-essential. There we go. Non-essential travel. Um, so, I mean, in general, it's kind of just putting a big old pause on it. But 
once this thing opens up, I think that the opportunity to finally get out there and go see something is going to make itself very apparent. <clears throat> I mean, I guess the other issue that this brings up, too, is, uh, you know, even with flights being that cheap in the States right now, there's, you know, we've never really had a paid leave system unless you're in one of the kind of the big mm. Fortune 500 countries. Sorry, companies. So I wonder if it's actually going to, you know, if it's going to, uh, like, the rest of the world is going to go start visiting stuff before it all actually comes falling apart and Americans get stuck at home, or if there's going to be enough uh, economic uh, opportunity to actually be able to capitalize on it. <clears throat> oh, look, it depends on sectors, and, like, I think all governments everywhere are, and if they're not, they should, shake mm-hmm. finger angrily um but like supporting these kind of businesses supporting these things and introducing like it's a, it's probably a golden time irregardless of your government like mm. to, to introduce these like as a short-term measure and be like fuck this is really good everyone's happy everyone's quite secure like yeah th- th- there's this kind of voter confidence so like i don't want to go too political in this podcast but like it, it's a good chance to change systems that have been needing change for a while yeah i think you're right i think it's a good kick in the pants to kind of uh, like wake people up as far as how wrong you know it, it's all been going but it's like easy to sort of put off if it's not an immediate concern and now that this is sort of literally made it an immediate concern for everybody all over the world regardless mm-hmm. of where you're from i think uh you're right on that and that it's the very least highlighting kind of what's been going wrong and to a certain extent that's it's actually a at least from my perspective like the only good thing of like the trump presidency is being able to highlight how many things have already been going wrong that sort of big bulky uh government system in the states and how easy it is to exploit like how it hasn't sort of gone more horribly or right earlier um like it probably has and we as a public just don't you never had the opportunity to know because no one was going to hop into office and sort of you know show us behind the veil or kind of you know the magician won't reveal his secrets but now with this deranged lunatic in office it's very easy to see where all of the different uh (laughs) the big sort of glaring issues in the american system have been and why while you know americans have regarded themselves as like the best nation in the world since like world war ii uh why it's actually all been falling apart since uh teddy roosevelt (laughs) and that guy couldn't even fall over like he was stuck in the chair so yeah exactly right But, but I, Paul, I, I, I say to my girlfriend, like the best thing about Estonia is that I don't understand Estonian politics because I don't understand the language. So yeah, win. there you go. Right. I mean, is, is it going to impact my paycheck? Yes or no? After outside of that, you know what I mean? Like, what are you going to do? Hmm. I think it's like it's a nice chance to like again come together as a community. Some people won't, but let let's not like let the ten percent or five percent or one percent like ruin it for everyone. And like right in times like this, it's just a chance not to be a dick. And even yeah. like, you know, governments we don't like or political views we don't like across the board, the 90%, it's like, oh, that's a nice rational action. That's quite nice. Yeah. Like, it, yeah, exactly. Thank you for doing your job. <laughs> thanks, thanks for being reasonable. <laughs> What's well, actually funny about that is uh, I believe that like the entire continent of Africa has only had like three coronavirus cases. <laughs> Uh, and, like we'll, we'll see what happens um, right but like as far as like spread and everything else like they've been uh extremely sustainable um operations and still are more or less open uh and part of the reasoning or rationale that some people are kind of coming out with is that because they've kind of used to dealing with a lot of these bigger pandemics and you know especially like you know the situation of ebola that happened you know like half a decade back um like the swine flu and H1N1 and all that stuff, they do have a pretty uh, decent infrastructure to deal with, like, you know, these problems. There's a lot of people on the ground with, like, you know, Doctors Without Borders, and there's a lot of folks that are already actively involved in the medical field on the ground that, you know, essentially, they're already almost predisposed to the idea of self-containment and management when it comes to handling disease. It's always been such a huge uh, problem, uh, specifically with the AIDS virus and stuff like that. So... It's interesting to see that, you know, I guess through the strife of, you know, their history, they've been able to, at the very least, kind of come out ahead with all this sort of going terribly awry, uh, but them already sort of being prepared to deal with, you know, something that would be so uh, detrimental to, as we're seeing, society in the Western world.
But then again, I guess the counter argument in that case could also be like, well, look how interconnected, like, uh, uh, apologies, (laughs) interconnected. Interconnected? Interconnected. There's the word. Um, The Western world or like China is with the Western world, like America, Europe, etc. Also with Iran, like, I'm not going to make any judgments here, but like they haven't handled it very well. And yeah. how that then has in turn, look at the immigration, like the, the different like uh, travel routes between Europe and Iran. Right. Um, Africa is kind of not so prevalent in terms of that international travel, yeah. airways, like uh, flight paths. So it could be a late, an unfortunate late hit. But again, speculation. Fucked if I know anything about anyone or I mean, <laughs> anything to do with virals or uh, medicine and like actual like <laughs> who like preventative measures it's all speculation right. so You're right 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 I, uh, at I least mean, we're saying this verbally and not sharing it on twitter well i mean we are dedicating a channel to our misinformation so i mean it's mm. <laughs> i mean but at the very least shit, though, like well right i mean at least we're not coming out and saying like this is definitively the truth like go out and buy your silver so you can cure yourself you know what i mean like it, i feel like in quarantine like these types of chats are naturally going to pop up so it's we're kind of taking the path of least resistance when it kind of comes to, well, what's like, you know, what Occam's razor, right? What's the easiest explanation for, you know, why these things are happening? I think you're right. Like, especially with a lot of, I mean, you can even see it economically. Like if you, if you like, all right, obviously like the outbreak in Europe is going to be more severe because the borders are essentially none, right? With the EU and everybody being able to cross and go interchange. And on top of that, having the access to being able to go from, you know, let's say London to Madrid for 20 pounds, Mm. right? the constant movement is significantly more consistent. So naturally, of course, it's going to spread a disease um, a lot faster. Meanwhile, you have, uh, you know, in Africa itself, country between country, you're looking at very, very high priced flights. Um, And on top of that, not that many between major points. So you're looking Mm. at a lot less total travel and a lot less people being exposed uh, to, you know, uh, possibly, you know, a vector, you know, a person who's contagious simply on the merit of like the inaccessibility to travel i mean and even when you do do it right like the distance between let's say cape town and casablanca i mean <laughs> that's, that's like wild. that it's like it's i think like three quarters the distance of like the la flight to uh like sydney like it's like 10 hours to get up there it, it's like no short feet it's a massive continent so it's like you know first of all while business and trade do happen at that scale, how often mm. is anybody going to be flying that distance? Like, you know, even you as an Australian, how many times a year do you go back? Like just to, having to spend 20 hours on a flight, 15, anything more than six just gets uncomfortable. So like having to do that across the African continent, I, can, I can't imagine it's going to be that common of an occurrence as opposed to, you know, going between Paris and Madrid or, you know, uh, Venice mm. and... Ukraine or you know anywhere else, right? Well, like you look at long-term travel as well. There was a really good article about like about sixty odd years ago, to fly to from Sydney to London was like this ridiculously expense. It's like sure no, t- two average annual years work for like mm-hmm. the average work is income. That's the cost of a flight, and now it's like the average person can fly to Europe, return within one or two weeks worth of work. Like yeah, it's com- like incredibly shrunk and like. Globalization is great, but like when it comes to crises, it kind of sucks. But well, here, like he, here we are talking, like communicating. I can still go to my PlayStation, watch TV, and like quite easily deal with like even the repercussions of kind of like the effects of your like your mental well-being. I can talk to you, right? Video call, fucking brilliant. Like, right? I can go in the PlayStation. I can read a book. I can read the news. Like. Right. So I think there are some people who are like global alarmists and saying, oh, no, we should all be introverted. It's like, nah, this right. is brilliant. Like shit happens irregardless. Right. And I think and to that point, and I'm curious on your take on this. Do you think that if this were just a Chinese issue or just an American issue, that we would have the same response uh, as far as trying to be a global community resolving the issue? Like, because so what I mean is sort of like, all right, with the Ebola outbreak, it was mostly centralized in uh, what uh, Western Africa, right? So naturally, a lot of countries are sending resources to this one, you know, sort of infection zone to help them resolve and, you know, do whatever, right? But it was still very distinctly an African problem, right? Um, you know, the spread of Ebola didn't go internationally, you know, it, you know, it was very contained in Africa, and then everybody sent resources to resolve the problem there. But because coronavirus became this international, you know, pandemic, 
do you think that uh, do you think that it was better that it became this international thing so that everybody had to put their best minds on solving the problem? And do you think it would have been worse if it would have just remained a China problem? Well, like this is kind of like Pandora's box here, right? Um, think, thinking about it, it's China's problem. It depends on like their vested interests in the world. Like on, on a global scale, people relate to different countries in different ways. And like I think the, there was the Stalin figure once of like you know what he said is like, oh, one death is a tragedy, but like you know a thousand or a million is just a figure. Right. Sorry for miss probably I'm paraphrasing there, but like. If if you read like about some distant country like and there's this severe outbreak like 2000 dead it, it's just a number but like I know Australian society has an affinity with American society British society New Zealand society mm -hmm. it doesn't become race it becomes about this whole kind of interconnectedness in terms of what how do we like feel about other countries not like right. the color of your skin but it goes back what to do history. we owe them right what, what do we owe them? Like, how close are we? Are we, like, best buddies? Or are we, like, very foreign, distant cousins? Like, as right. an Australian, you wouldn't feel the same if there was a terrorist attack, let's say, in, like, um, San Marino or, like... Sure. Papua New like, maybe even, like, um, Marshall Islands. Sure. Then you would if it, like, happened in central London. Like, you have this right. kind of affinity with the people because of, your, again, your history, background, etc. Right. Melbourne's the biggest Greek city, so of course things happen in Greece, you feel more affected. Sure. And it's about interconnected relationships, like the, the way you feel more. So, of course, we'd feel quite strongly if China was suffering, it's the biggest like, country in the world. Australian dollar is like essentially tied to the one because, again, all our exports and imports and the way we're so linked right. with China. And we've seen that with the Australian exchange rate, like, getting fucked right. um like australia uh, euro bought one dollar sixty a month ago and now it buys one dollar eighty five like that's a jump oh, wow. of 25 cents yeah that's that's a so, big chunk that's almost the yeah. i mean that's almost the difference between the american dollar and the pound as it used to be yeah which is crazy so, things are all a bit topsy-turvy but in the way we approach things like it, it literally comes down to history and I, I i hate those people say oh it's it's racist it's like no yeah we don't australians don't have an affinity with chad directly historically or wh right. wherever like there's no trade route or anything so china is probably not our best buddy like we'd be much more concerned if it had originated in the uk and stayed in the uk or northern america or canada because right. again historical roots right that kind of answers the questions are not too much of a ramble yeah so i mean yeah i think i think you're very right in that sense where it's a lot easier for nations that have already worked together to work to continue to work together and find these solutions. So, I mean, like I mentioned before, you know, the U.S. and Canada are going to come out in a joint statement because not only they're obviously bound by trade and a border, uh, but it's the whole NAFTA thing, right? Where I mean, yeah. now it's kind of up in the air with Trump in office and stuff like that. But a uh, perfect example is all right, we share a border with Canada that they're right there, but we also share a border with Mexico, and yeah. it's a joint statement with America and Canada, not America and Mexico, because of obviously our political differences. Um, at least at the national level with immigration and all that stuff. Um, so it, it's, you know, it, theoretically, it, you know, everybody's involved in NAFTA. They share a border with the United States, but we're coming out with Canada because of, again, that sort of, I mean, you know, it, it is, I guess, in a sense, kind of racist, but really it's more about nationalism, right? It's about we are Anglophiles more, more than any part of Mexico is, right? I don't know what hmm. the, is it... Hispanophile or Hispanophile. I don't know what the word is, but you get what I mean? Like, as Americans, you're going to look to Canadians and be like, oh, they're more like us, then yeah, we can work with them, as opposed to seeing them as, you know, this scourge from Mexico that's coming to take our jobs and now, you know, and doing whatever, right? I think that's definitely like on a national sentiment, but like if it's more of a local sentiment, depends on your demographics. Like the, some yeah. of the southern states would have a more Hispanic kind of heritage. Right. And of that's course, exactly they'll right. give a little bit more of a fuck. A hundred percent. Especially if you're like, you know, if you're looking at like California, Arizona, like directly on the border, yeah. like a hundred percent. Right. But, you know, our capital is tied to the East Coast, that very sort of eastern northeast mentality uh, in that little corridor between Toronto, D.C., Montreal, all of those things are all in this sort of little cluster that's always sort of told the rest of the country how it's going to go, right? And that's part of the reason why mm. the South hates the North um, in a lot of different respects and why they are they sort of take this level of pride to be so, I guess, like discouraging of Northeast elitism, but also discouraging of Southwestern sort of 
Hispanic expansion because now they're getting literally pigeonholed. And ironically, Florida is their last bastion of hope. And that's essentially little Cuba. So, yeah, they're slowly getting closed in. <laughs> closed in on. If we, if we named it little Cuba, I'd be so much more like <laughs> interested in going like little Cuba. Oh, man, the cultural well, heritage, like the, <laughs> like the music, the, the food. That sounds great. But then it's like Florida. It's like eh, I saw too many videos yeah. of Florida man, Florida man does Florida. this, that or the other. But little Cuba, much right. more like, again, you have this different village. Mainland Cuba. <laughs> I mean, that's honestly what oh, it is. Oh, no, no, no. Little Cuba has Just all the little best Cuba. bits of mainland Cuba. Like. Well, I mean, in Miami, they do have Little Havana. I mean, I guess it's they're equivalent of like a Chinatown, but for Cubans. So, I mean, that it's already... Good, yeah, no, I mean, it's it's super dope. Like, as it's, it's far as, like, food and, like, dance and, like, having Cuban culture in America. And not even just Cuban, right? But we're talking about, like, you know, Caribbean culture. So... Puerto Ricans and, you know, Bahamanians and people that, you know, traditionally sort of uh, come into uh, the United States from those Caribbean cultures, Jamaicans, for instance. There's a lot of that in Little Havana, but it's predominantly Cuban. Um, I, I have to say, like, the one thing that's put off me off, like, Miami, not like Florida, I'd love to go to certain parts and maybe for work, I can, like, work your trip there. But Stephen Fry, like, this British kind of comedian, like, personality. Yeah, he, he him and Hugh Laurie used to have their show, right? Oh, brilliant show. Like, even, like, um, uh, Rowan Atkinson was involved. Brilliant, brilliant shows, brilliant comedy. But he did mm. the show of, like, he did in a black London cab, all 50 states in America. Okay. And he flew to Hawaii. So he did 49 and flew to Hawaii for one bit. Sure. But, like, he does a nice little, of course, some states more get a feature than others. But, like, the one he gives the least is Florida because he goes to Miami and says, you know, oh, here's Miami, you know. Yeah. And then it cuts, like, I'm leaving Miami. It was a bit of a shit show. There's no culture here. It's all like glass, alcohol, like just a party mm-hmm. scene. It's like a big nightclub, a yeah. very typical nightclub. There's nothing interesting about Miami explicitly. Yeah, no, and that's 100% correct. I mean, like, there's the, um, so like, uh, like Miami, Miami has a couple of cultural facets, but they're all extremely superficial, right? Like when, like even the the idea of like that diet fat that popped up in the in the nineties, it was like the Miami Beach diet or whatever it was. Mm. Um, you know, the whole point of like you go to Miami because you're there to literally just show off what you've been working out on, you know, at the gym and go lay on a beach and sort of, you know, every chick is in a white bikini, every dude is like shredded greased back hair and perfectly tan and then you go to the nightclub and spend you know so many thousands of dollars on bottle service and that's you know like the uh yeah yeah. i don't know if you know nick kroll bobby bottle service (laughs) kroll yeah Yeah. uh, that what's that cartoon show like um fuck nick kroll's like director and actor yeah like yeah the the beauty one like big mouth hormone monster yeah that's the one big mouth yeah uh, but when he still had the Kroll show, he had this guy, a character who was like essentially Bobby Bottle Service, who was this New York douchebag who would like hang out in the meatpacking district, but it's essentially <laughs> that as a whole city. Uh, as far as just like the general sort of douchebaggery that goes on and all the sort of superficial nonsense that kind of takes on. I mean, and now because of, you know, the influx of, you know, Cubans and a lot of different uh, Hispanic immigrants, there is actually little pockets of culture that are developing that are more than just, you know, how much money can I spend or how... M- you know, how much of a great time can I have? Like how, you know, like the, was it the Bilzerian dude who just goes on boats and surrounds himself with models? Like Miami is becoming something a little bit more than it used to be. Um, but you also have to keep in mind that Miami was the uh, main entry point for cocaine to the United States. So it was, especially during the 80s, it was entirely driven by just partying, people losing their minds. Um, it's just just doing what they had to do just to keep the they were party blown going. away blown away blown away by the important <laughs> business right but i mean that that's where a lot of those people got a lot of that very lavish amount of money just being in nightclubs were obviously a big thing because that's where you could sell it without you know making sure that the cops would stay out and like all that mob run stuff cartel driven business ended up building miami to what it became and then once that sort of started depleting as like the main source of income and actual industry started coming in you get these bigger companies and banks and like, you know, your, your Disney's and your you know, universal studios and a bunch of other money that was legit started coming in. You know, you start seeing this dissipation of uh, <laughs> that sort of scene. Cause it's not like, 
And, like, that's a very Miami problem. But if you think about, like, the Fort Lauderdales or, like, the Orlandos, like, nobody has anything good to say about, aside from the thing that's there, right? Like, like yeah. for example, Gainesville. What's what's there? The Gaines, University obviously. of Florida. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, the University of Florida. All right, another college town. But, like, Jacksonville? All right, they have the Jaguars, but what else is there? Nobody knows. Like, a aside swamp. from Miami. I heard, I heard the really good swamp. Exactly right. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the telling signs of the shift in culture is uh, now um, David Beckham, uh, Posh Spice's husband, decided yeah. to uh, start up Miami or Inter Miami FC. Um, and it's actually become a, a pretty interesting sort of uh, like point of pride for a lot of the folks that have lived in Miami and are very much outside of that sort of high end luxe uh, mm. lifestyle. Um, a lot, a lot of Hispanics naturally sort of obviously support soccer or footy, as you call it. Um, and because of it, they're starting to get again other industries that are somehow more conducive mm. to building culture as opposed to just kind of sticking with that high life, fast rolling sort of party vibe. It's it's interesting you bring up that because again, like I've heard so many stories about this like this club, like the, the amount of issues and like they're saying soccer is like the going to be number two sport and I never say number one because of course no. it's not going to be number one in America because who's this rolling diving little asshole who gets paid way too much <laughs> but like this kind of idea of it's like cashing in on the people the American society has been giving shit to for so long like yeah. these now new middle-aged Hispanic sorry not middle-aged middle-class Hispanic like class in itself like yeah. well what do you guys like what right. can we cash in on finally <clears throat> on you guys who've come right. here the immigrants and like worked your asses off and your parents worked their asses off and they finally have money. It's funny to see like white middle America or in this case, white like guy who talks like he's a 12 year old pre puberty. How are they cashing in on it is by making these things for them. So like it's a, it's an interesting change of like once they see a commodity in this group of people, they're like, Oh, we'll do anything to please them because they bring money. Because again, well, right. sport is a business. Like that, that's course. all it is. And with this quarantine thing, it's a bit of a tragedy that like you you realize how uh, how closely we're tied to it, regardless of its actual sort of inherent value. Hmm. And you, and you do see like I think the worst in people. Uh, the best quote I saw on Twitter recently was like, "Sport is the most important of the least important things in life." Correct. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, I, you know it's because it's you know what it is. It's and there I always go back and forth in my head about this, where the you know how like in movies about um, you know somehow some dictator comes to power and then their like whole idea is like people need to be told what to do and what to like. Like it's not like freedom. You know, is is this idea? But we don't actually want freedom. Like we like to be spoon fed and given. You know, whatever. So of course I should have the power. You know, like that. That's their main argument, right? And then I think about it, especially in times like this, and I'm like, you know, as like a society, we should have elevated ourselves to the point where like, you know, the uselessness of sport, like, should have just kind of like fizzled away. Like, it, we should have just been like, all right, we could, you know, save the, you know, three billion dollars on building the stadium and put it into like better trains or a hospital or whatever, right? But we haven't. Mm. And on top of that, sports are still growing. <laughs> like new sports every day now, especially, are becoming a thing that people are investing in. There's professional tag on YouTube. Oh, it's brilliant. And it then, is. Uh, the, the dodgeball and like right. even someone was sharing this, a, uh, a commentated on marble track. So the it was a two minute World clip Series. of people racing marbles. It's like rolling down a hill with live right. commentary. Exactly. Um, we <laughs> like, like again, like, What's better for us, this shiny new three billion dollar stadium or a hospital right. that I might use at some stage? Like, right? And we but I mean, how many? Our... Well, you got to keep in mind too that we're like we're also thinking about like, all right, so even all right, so the shiny new stadium that you'll probably use more than the hospital, ideally if you're a healthy person, fine. But also like, how many times in a year? You know what I mean? Like, exactly. short of having season tickets, like okay, maybe a handful of times. Like, all right. You take any, like, let's say an MLS, right? That's like 40-something games a season or something. Might be that's, less. Yeah, it's pretty good. 40, 30, 35 to 40, roughly, right. like, for most All right, half leagues. of those are away. So you're down to, yeah. like, 15, 20. All right, I mean, like, I think, 
I think the where the one thing that we're kind of sort of skirting around is that like the reason that we can sort of see it as the least valuable thing, but with such a high value, is that especially in the modern day, it's kind of where like culture sort of begins. Like mm. I think especially as Americans, like there is a lot of culturelessness, like that is completely outside of work. Um, like I mean, you know, even something as simple as like you meet an American anywhere. Like, first question is, you know, where are you from? I'm American. Their second question out of their mouths is probably going to be, oh, what do you do? Mm. You know, like, it, like, and it's it's always meant as, you know, what do you do for work, right? Like, that's just a very American thing of, you know, okay, cool, where you're from, but then also what is, what is it that you're working in or doing to essentially make money, as if it actually matters, right? But because of that... Like, you know, Americans work themselves to the bones. They don't have, you know, as we're now finding out, paid leave, uh, you know, appropriate health care for especially situations like this. There isn't a whole lot of life outside of work that actually happens in a meaningful way where no. and it's part of it because, you know, the United States is a very young country, right? 200 years and change. you got to think that Australia and the United States came about around the same time, like in history, I think within like maybe 30 years of each other. Mm. But... Um, and then, you know, and as you can kind of see as these sort of offshoots of English culture, um, you know, they kind of had to figure it out for themselves in their own sort of different ways, but they're also kind of equally immature cultures because, you know, there isn't a whole lot of depth to it aside from, you know, the history of war or the history of international involvement, like aside from, I mean, I would imagine, you know, particularly strong opinions on the aboriginals and the flavor of Vegemite, you know, what is something that is like truly Australian culture internationally, like, you know, surfing, barbecuing, you know, that sort of beach sort of, you know, chill out life, like, you know, that vibe, right? Like it's a stereotype, yeah. but as far as like internationally exported culture, like that's kind of that's like, it. Oh, and right. beer. a lot and, of beer and beer. I mean, that's, that's everyone, but you know, in this, and it's the same thing with like, the U S if we didn't have Hollywood, what would there be out of the U.S. aside from war? Basketball, NFL, um, right? Fast food, um, right? Work, work, work. <laughs> mainstream brands, like yeah, capitalism. <laughs> capitalism, <laughs> like, baby, game on. Right, but like ex aggressively late stage capitalism, and I think that, but like when you think about like Germany and you think about the European territories that have had almost, you know, the better part of a millennium to develop into their own sort of rich heritage and culture. Like when I think Germany, my first thought isn't like, you know, uh, this, it's, it's not like the banking industry in Frankfurt. It's not the centralization of the Euro around that bank, right? It's, it's pretzels, sausages, beer, right. sausages, Oktoberfest. This kind of like umpa ba bands, like. Right, yeah, Lederhosen and, you know, and it's it's simple little things that aren't, you know, like as if if you didn't know about why Lederhosen became a thing in that Bavarian part of the world, like you know, it would just be it would still be sort of like a cultural marker, right? The same way that mm. you know, when I think about English culture, I immediately think of the Adidas tracksuit clad chav, but at the same time, a Victorian era gentleman with a top hat and cane. You know what I mean? Like it's just clothes, but you know, there's all these different little pieces and. Uh, the royal aspect. family like right. fish and shit like the, the the shit food because it's like oh fish and chips what else uh right yeah. all, all the stuff we stole from other countries tikka masala um, <laughs> curry sauce yeah, chippies you'll, <laughs> you'll find some of the best asian food in like england <laughs> it's amazing yeah. like there's chicken there's like um indian curries and pakistani curries and all like yeah. it's different kind of subcontinental asian food it's amazing and like again Absolutely. the big yeah. the biggest flag you can wave like in pro like um, <clears throat> the clash of cultures is like, look at everyone. Just like we're all different. We just still get along. Like, come on, guys. Yeah. Like, look at the food. <laughs> That's the first. Po Their like, national if you go dish to a is racist masala. Person, <laughs> yeah, you go to a racist person, and the first thing you say is like, "What are you? What are you eating? Like, come on, right? Man. Like, what are you wearing? Exactly. Like, I uh, I forget who did the sketch, but they were talking. Uh, I don't know if it was like a stand-up comic or if it was something that I saw on YouTube. But it was talking about like, who's in charge of cooking for like clan meetings. And if so, like, is it just burgers and hot dogs? Like, 
<laughs> what are and, they? And both of them are German and due to immigration. Right, like... exactly. So there's this, like, and this is actually like a fun kind of way to wrap things up because I mean, it does kind of come full circle, right? For the people out there, like, you know, right now everything's kind of a lockdown or whatever it is, but it's also a really good time to kind of take stock uh, as, as to like your own personal investment is kind of like what you're missing out on by not getting out there, right? Like now we're forced mm. to not get out there. Um, and, you know, so be it. But at the same time, now I feel like a lot of people are sort of like online. They're like, oh, people have been doing a lot of other shit this whole time. How can I, hopefully when the borders open up again and everything sort of ends up hunky-dory, you know, how can I capitalize on that when I get the opportunity? And I'm hoping that uh, this sort of push for isolationism is going to have the opposite effect. So when people finally do get out there, they're a lot more appreciative of not only just other people's cultures, but what they have to offer. And ideally, like Tika Masala, bring back home to better their own life experience and the life experience of others. Yeah. I look, I, th I think the overwhelming thing will be like this, this sense of like a global relief and like the, the parties and getting to appreciate everyone and everything in life. There'll be the like negative kickback, of course, of like rabble, rabble, rabble of just dumb people. Right, but like I'll, I, the first thing I want to do is go travel and go to like the the little local like foreign restaurant or just right. hang out with friends. Like my office has got like dozens, like over seventy nationalities represented. Like I love right. all those people. Like, yeah. uh, and that's something you miss out on reflection by isolation. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a really good point. Like it, it is, again, it, it's we talked about it a little bit when it comes to like politics and sort of like internal uh, issues. But I think this time that we have to take to ourselves is best used uh, to do exactly what you're saying and, and reflect, um, you know, on everything, like every little thing that, you know, what's essential is now becoming sort of more obvious than it used to be. I think it was very easy to continuously distract yourself and sort of try to be dismissive of um, kind of what was actually sort of needed. But now with people sort of realize like, hey, maybe I can take that day to work from home. Maybe I can now start sort of taking my life back and especially like from the American uh, ideas of like, you know, work being everything, everybody can sort of take a look back and sort of be like, hey, you know, now I can start kind of like appreciating family again. Like, oh, now that I have this time to be able to actually, um, you know, see the value of it against kind of the human condition of sort of life and death, mm -hmm. right? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, back here they are. You know, we want to keep things light and funny, but here, here we are, stuck across the world from each other. <laughs> might have, it Literally might have stuck. It, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, we wanted to do the uh, live podcast all over Eastern Europe, uh, but we'll see if we can capitalize on those cheap fares once everything sort of uh, settles down. <laughs> I'm already looking like forward to the Shivapi, the like the Rakia, like. Oh my everything. God, Shivapi, dude! I, I, you know what? I really miss more than anything though. It's the Your burek, sauce? burek and beer. Oh, the burek, dude. Just give me a nice cold or even like a room temperature because they were always room temperature Sarajevo, and a burek for like fifty cents. <laughs> like that is heaven. <laughs> I remember waking up every morning to a burek, a, a overly sugarized juice, and a cigarette. Yeah, like one of those counterfeit Marlboro. <laughs> Where they took like mulch and just shoved it into a cigarette. Oh God, so good. So and fake good. paper. Oh God. But on no. that note, I reckon we we call it. Yeah, I uh, think that's a thank good. Thank you, Alex. To, absolutely, thank you, sir. And we will uh, be releasing this one, I think, pretty close to now. And then we have a couple of other episodes coming up behind it. So do stay tuned. Check out the shelf for some of our writings. Now that we have all this time to stay indoors and muse, uh, we'll be updating that as well. Uh, we'll be coming out with another episode of the Common Room Podcast. Um, later on this week uh and as always keep your wonder funky thanks for listening